Good morning. I just want you to know no babies were hurt in filming of the Fajar promo video. Uh, you know, I, I was telling the last service at 8.30, I just love, I mean, you are a, a real handsome bunch. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I, yes. And I, I sincerely have a love for this church. And the church, by the way, is not a building. It's a group of people. So I just want you to know that I, I love you. I have, love having an opportunity on Sunday mornings to get up here and just to share a little bit of my heart and some of the things that God is teaching me out of his word. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, like who's this guy who just said he loves me? Uh, let me introduce myself real quick so this is less awkward. Uh, my name's Matt. I get to serve at ACC as one of the pastors here. It's just a real privilege I have on most Sundays. Um, I get to stand up here and, and teach during this portion of our service. And let me tell you what, you know, those of you who've been with us uh, just for the last three weeks, the last three, or th- uh, three week series we just did, uh, I didn't really get to preach. And I love to to teach. I like to go into God's Word and really teach. And the last three weeks, we've spent more time almost in like a business meeting and just kind of sharing a little bit about our church. So I am super pumped that we get to, again, dive into God's Word and and explore something. And what we're going to be talking about is, is a brand new series called The Greatest Chapter. We are going to explore Romans chapter 8. Now, let me tell you this, a lot of, have anyone seen The Greatest Showman? The Greatest Showman, you can see our font, we kind of designed it around The Greatest Showman font because, you know, it's kind of uh, something that's happening right now. My wife and I, and we took our girls, we went and watched The Greatest Showman on its opening weekend. Fun fact about me, I love pretty much any movie where they just stop randomly talking and start singing instead. So, The Greatest Showman was one of those musical movies It was a really awesome movie. We enjoyed it immensely. I don't want to tell you the ending uh, because you should go see it. It was that great. But ultimately what it was, it was a story about a guy who was understanding and realizing what was truly most important in his life. And as we have an opportunity now to go into God's Word and explore it, my prayer for us this morning is that we can see in God's Word, when we gather here on Sunday mornings, when we worship together, I always want us to be in tune with what is most important. What is it in our life uh, that, that needs to be changed because there's something important in God's Word that we need to apply? You know, we, we talk about the greatest chapter. How do I know that it's the greatest chapter? There's a lot of people, uh, just trust me on this, a lot of theogen, theologians, Bible experts who will say, Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in all the Bible. Now that doesn't mean that the rest of it is less important, okay? All Bible, all of God's Word is, is useful. The Bible even says that. All of it has been written for a purpose. And there's something in here in every single word that, that is important. But there's so much crammed into one chapter of Scripture. Now listen, when Paul wrote this, this letter... He didn't break it down by chapters, right? He didn't write a chapter and then say, all right, now let's put a big eight and keep writing. We added those. Um, But inside this chapter, there's so much truth that it's just, it just makes it the greatest. I'm convinced, and my goal today is to show you three reasons why I think Romans chapter eight is the greatest chapter in scripture. And then over the next three weeks, We're going to explore more of Romans chapter 8, and you're going to see even more reasons why it's the greatest. And at the end of it, you might still have your favorite chapter somewhere else. That's awesome, Uh, but you'll you'll at least know why this is my, my favorite. I will tell you what, we throw around the word favorite or greatest or best. We throw those words around pretty haphazardly nowadays, don't we? You know, some I asked my my five year old yesterday, I said, I, I was writing my sermon, and to prove a point, I was like, I wonder what's going to happen if I ask Molly her favorite color. Now, by definition, favorite, right, it means I'm expecting to get back a color, right? So I ask Molly, what is your favorite color? And I get aqua, pink, purple, and yellow. So you just understand, right? I will often, if I'm encouraging someone in our congregation or shooting a text back to you, I might say something like, you're the best, Listen, I want you to know I probably said that same thing to the guy I just encouraged before you. 
So you are awesome, right? I'm really appreciative of all of you. But we throw around that word a little, like, a little maybe more easily than we should. I want you to know, I am not throwing that around haphazardly today. I really think Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in Scripture. And that's why I'm excited to share with you why I think that and what's in here. Uh, Let's pray together. Father, I ask right now that you would be entirely present in each of our lives. God, that everyone in this room, a body of believers making up your church, that we would be able to hear from you today, that your truth that you've crammed into this one passage of a letter to Rome. God, that we would be able to take out of it some things that we need to learn and to apply to our own lives so that we can be transformed into the likeness of your Son. Thank you so much for the truth that is in this passage. We ask now that you'd be honored and glorified in the teaching of it. God, I pray personally that you would speak through me. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So go ahead and grab your Bible and let's turn to Romans chapter 8. We are going to spend all day in Romans 8, so you can go ahead and earmark that if you want. Dog ear it, put a bookmark there. Not only today, but the next two weeks, we are going to be in Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, I want us all to go through God's Word together. So go ahead and grab a Bible from the seat in front of you and turn to Romans chapter 8. If you don't own a Bible at all, Take that Bible you just grabbed and write your name in it and take it home with you. So now you have a Bible. We want you to have that. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to start with the first four verses. We're going to call it the greatest news. If you are taking notes this morning, I have three things I'm going to submit to you this morning of why uh, just in the first third of Romans chapter 8, there's already three greatest things in here. And the first one is the greatest news. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. It says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son In a body like the bodies of us sinners. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. By giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Who no longer follow our sinful nature. But instead follow the spirit. You'll notice in here that there are multiple terms that are being used that point to this idea of of a legal verdict. We see this idea at the very first verse, right? This idea of condemnation. This is a a legal term. It, It implies ultimately that there has been something that happened that you did and that I did and that there was a just and fair trial and we were found guilty and now are under the condemnation of our guilt. This is a legal term. And we see in verse 4 this idea that the, the just requirement of the law being fulfilled. There's, there's a lot of implications here. When I think of the word condemnation, I, I can't help but take a little bit off that word and just the word condemn is something that we understand sometimes from a, uh, a, a perspective of a building. Imagine a building that, that the county has looked at it and they have decided this building is no longer useful. They're, this building is no longer safe. Nothing good can, no, can happen anymore in this building. So the, the boards are put up on the windows and a big sticker is put on the front door so that everybody knows this building is useless and pointless and condemned. Don't go in it. And to have that same mentality in that picture, knowing that you and I, in our sin, at one point at least, because we know from this scripture, were condemned. Our lives, because of sin, were boarded up. They they seemed hopeless. They seemed useless. And all of a sudden, this greatest news of therefore, there is now no condemnation. 
What an incredible bit of news for us. And if we're really going to understand this verse, we have to understand that the very first part of, of Romans 8.1 says, So then, or some of your Bibles might say, therefore. In other words, we need to look at what was just said. Now, some people will go all the way back to Romans 1 through 7. A lot of people say in order to understand Romans chapter 8, verse 1, you have to first understand Romans 1 through 7. I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I think more specifically that therefore is pointing back just to Romans chapter 7 and some of the content in Romans chapter 7. Before we get to that, in Romans 5 and 6, there's a lot of talk in Scripture where Paul says, uh, ultimately, he, he gives the idea of being dead to sin. That therefore, because you, know, because you have Christ, you are now dead to sin. And the frustrating thing for me in my own walk with Christ is that has not been uh, the reality that I experience on most days. I get frustrated with myself. I hear about this guy named Paul who's saying now that because I have Christ, I should be dead to sin. And then I go into the world and into my life and I find myself struggling and thinking things I shouldn't think and saying things I shouldn't say. And I'm like, why is this truth not a reality for me? Why am I not experiencing this complete just deadness to sin? Why is that not happening? And then thankfully, Paul gives us a little bit more taste as to what he means and and helps us see the reality of how most of our lives probably look in Romans chapter 7. And here's one of the verses that just blows my mind because I think of the Apostle Paul as just like this guy that man if I could just if we if everyone in this room could just be like Paul that would be so awesome. Now I'm not going to change that listen if you and I could all be like Paul that would be great but listen what Paul is about to say. Romans chapter 7, he says this in verse 14 and 15. He says, The trouble is with me, for I am all too human. How many humans in this, war, in this room right now? All right. Paul too. I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. This is like this struggle that all of us whether you follow Jesus in your life or you don't follow Jesus we all know this struggle of we constantly find ourselves doing things we don't want to do we see things we ought to do and we don't do them we find this constant struggle and Paul is saying the exact same thing I too am human and I too experience the same frustration in my life and then what happens is we see the desperation of Paul's sin and he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, he says, listen to this. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Listen, church, do you hear the desperation in Paul's voice? Just starting with the word, oh. Oh, you know, that agony. What a miserable person I am. Who is going to fix this problem in me called sin? Now this is Paul already with a relationship with Christ. This is, this is I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, Paul, telling you this right now. Who is going to free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? This, this struggle, this real question that he's longing to, to understand that's just kind of a pattern that goes through Paul's mind have you ever experienced such anxiety or fear or guilt or something in your life that you just you just knew the weight of it was so much to bear that at some moment when somehow that was released when somehow you no longer had to bear it anymore somehow you no longer had to pay the fine for whatever it was when all that was gone the release was almost so overwhelming or it was so overwhelming that you found yourself in this weird emotional state where all you could do was break down in tears. It was just this moment of, whew! And your, your emotions are just such a wreck that you find yourself in tears that finally you found some peace to this problem. And, and what we're about to see is in the next verse, Romans chapter 7, verse 25, Paul finds this and he says, listen, listen, 
Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He tells us that the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He doesn't necessarily tell us what the answer is, but he does tell us the who of the answer. Who is going to free Paul? Who is going to free you? Who is going to free me from the, the weight of sin and guilt and condemnation in our lives? He says, listen, thank God it is in Jesus that we're going to find the answer to this question. And then we find ourselves at the greatest news of the Bible in the greatest chapter of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. One more time, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Listen, believer, look at me. If you have chosen to follow Christ, there is now no condemnation in your life. You can let go of that. You can experience the peace of that truth in your life. There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. You hear this imagery again of this freedom this, this release of shackles, this no longer being bound, this no longer being a slave, this, this idea of not being imprisoned by your guilt. Guilt is a really important word I want to talk about for a second because, listen, guilt is, is one of these things. It's another legal term. We're talking about condemnation. Another way to talk about condemnation would be this word guilt. It's one of these things that you and I experience when we do something we don't want to do. As we're experiencing those thoughts that Paul experiences, this idea of guilt is something that is not unfamiliar in our lives. And I, I think that a lot of times the way Satan distracts us from understanding that we are no longer under condemnation is Satan likes to whisper into my ear, and you are guilty. You are broken. You are condemned. Just this, this, this whisper that slowly gets louder and louder and louder until it's, it feels like a scream in our lives. And we just, that idea of you are a building that has no purpose. You are too dangerous to even be around. You are useless and you are pointless. And that little whisper turns into a scream. There's a story called A Pilgrim's Progress. And inside that story, there's two main uh, there's a main character named Christian, and Christian is traveling along a path to the celestial city. Now, this is a, a, a big allegory, a big metaphor, okay? So Christian, the main character, is on this path, and that path would be uh, basically uh, being in God's will, heading and doing the things that God wants Christian to do, and Christian is traveling with a companion named Hopeful, and as they're traveling along this path, their feet start to hurt because the path isn't very comfortable to walk on. How many of you have experienced that sometimes the Christian walk isn't super comfortable? So Christian and Hopeful are walking on this path and their feet start to hurt and they see off to the side this meadow that seems so much more comfortable to walk on. So they get off of the path. We also have a word for that in Scripture. Getting off of the path is called sin. Anytime we decide, I'm going to do things my way instead of remaining on the path that God set for me, that's called sin. So Christian and hopeful, they get off the path and they find themselves in this meadow. And then they end up falling asleep inside this meadow. Another good reminder that when we get off the path, we often get so stuck in the fact that we've done things our own way, we stop making any progress. They end up sleeping in this meadow. And they wake up to this character called the giant of despair. And the giant of despair uh, basically gathers them up and puts them in a dungeon called the dungeon of despair. This is that screaming I'm talking about in our lives when we experience sin and we go off the path and we do things our own way. This screaming, this, the, get this, the giant of despair's wife says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in every day to Christian and hopeful and I want you to beat them. <laughs> 
This is that understanding that we find ourselves in this, this pattern of feeling like, man, we are hopeless, that we are broken, and this screaming gets so loud in our ears that we find ourselves feeling like we're being beaten. And then Christian remembers that he has something in his pocket. This incredible story. You ought to read The Pilgrim's Progress. Christian realizes that in his pocket he has a thing called the, pro- the key of promise. I don't know why it took Christian so long to realize he had a key in his pocket. I don't know why it takes us so long to realize we have a key in our pocket. And Christian says, I, I'm going to go see if this key will unlock this dungeon. And sure enough, he's able to open up all the locks and the dungeon doors are open and Christian and hopeful, they run back as fast as they can to the path to Celestial City. Listen, Romans 8 verse 1 is that key to promise. It is that key that you have in your pocket. It is a key that each of us have have access to that will break us out of this dungeon of despair. Listen, you are no longer under condemnation. If you know you're locked in a dungeon and you use that key to get yourself out of it. That is the greatest news ever. And that leads us to another greatest inside these first few verses is the greatest guide ever. The greatest guide ever. I, I want to tell you uh, uh, something about me that's a little bit unique. I, one of my biggest weaknesses, I have an incredibly terrible sense of direction. At any point, at any given day, I usually have no idea where I am on a map. Listen, if you invite me to your home, I will use GPS to get me there. It doesn't matter if you tell me, oh, you just go up here and just turn left for the second house on the right. I don't care. I'm putting it into ways, and I'm using ways to get me there as a guide. Now, that doesn't sound so bad because maybe I don't know. I've never been to your house before. The sad part is, is that when I'm leaving your house, I will ways my way back to my house, okay? <laughs> I will figure out how to get from your house to my house from there. I, I, I just don't know. I have no idea which way I'm facing right now. I have no idea. Some of you, that's a gift. But listen, the idea of having a guide that can help direct you and lead you and show you where to go is something that's really, really helpful. Because when you're lost, you have a guide that can lead you. And Romans 8 talks about a guide like this. I want to show you a quick funny video. This is a video, uh, how many of you are familiar with Bob Newhart? So Bob Newhart is basically like the Seinfeld before Seinfeld. And... Um, Real, real funny guy. There's a little funny clip that I'm going to help make sense here in a second. Check this out. Tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, no, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes, yes, that's it. All right, well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, you're there. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. 
I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it! I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just... I love it. She's, uh, she's saying, well, you're trying to talk about her childhood, and she's trying to go back, and he's like, whoa, whoa, let's not go there. You know, let's not do the thing I mean, I'm supposed to do, which is kind of explore this. Now, we would all agree, I think, that that advice, that counsel was deficient, right? You know, she was coming probably with a sincere issue or a problem. Maybe it does have its roots somewhere in childhood. And that advice to just stop it, it's funny to laugh at, and it, it, it makes maybe a little bit of sense to say, hey, just don't do that anymore. But we would agree that 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 advice is not great advice in this situation because it basically sets Catherine, this woman, up to be self-reliant completely. That she's supposed to save herself from this problem and she's supposed to just rely on her own strength to just stop doing something that, that she hasn't been able to stop before. And that leads us to Romans chapter 8. I want to share with you something out of this. So Romans 8 verses 5 through 10. It says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to God at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Here's the, the truth behind that very first verse. Uh, that, that verse 5 is this. Preoccupation leads to path. Or preoccupation determines path. In other words, the things that you fill your mind with, the things that you allow your mind to be preoccupied with, will determine which way you move. It will determine which path that you're on. And we have two paths that are talked about here in this, in this passage. We have, we have one way which you could call living by the flesh. And we have another way called living by the spirit. And in verse 5 it's very clear. It says those who are dominated. In other words those who are preoccupied by the sinful nature. Think about sinful things. But those who are dominated or controlled by or preoccupied by the Holy Spirit. Think about things that are godly. And this, this promise that we see in here, this two paths. And oh, let me talk real fast about living by the flesh. Living by the flesh, the best way I can understand preoccupation with the flesh would be ultimately uh, not like living according to worldly desires. Let me share a few. A lot of people in this room, maybe you're preoccupied by popularity. Maybe that's the thing that just drives you. You want to be liked. When you're not liked, it doesn't go well with you. And your mind just thinks about it. And you are so preoccupied with popularity that you don't have room to, to be directed anywhere else. Maybe some of you, uh, it's success and wealth that preoccupies your mind. Maybe it's pleasure. Maybe there's just a, you, you focus your mind on how can I be pleased what feels good, what tastes good, what do I like, what I don't like, and you just folk, you're preoccupied with pleasure. One of the things for me is, is I get preoccupied with ease and comfort. I'll tell you what, once you're up on that lazy boy and you've kicked your feet up, it's someone else's job to get the light switch at that point, right? I mean, it's like it's just so easy for us to get so preoccupied with what can I do so that I don't have to be uncomfortable. How can I, uh, you know, it, oh, you need help serving somewhere? Which job requires the least, you know, actual physical exertion from me? 
Like, that's where we kind of lean, right? If it's, oh, you need manual labor or need someone to cut bagels. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with cutting bagels. There's nothing wrong with manual labor. There's something awesome about every one of those, those un- understandings. Every single piece of serving within this church is very important. And if God's called you to that, do that. I'm not knocking serving in a way that sounds a little bit easier. But m- for me, this is, this is Matt talking about Matt. When I have to choose between the two, and I know that God's blessed me in a way where I can handle manual labor, I often would rather choose something that doesn't require manual labor. Because that preoccupies my mind of how can I stay comfortable and, and do something a little bit easier. And when we focus and we preoccupy our minds on things that are of the world, the Bible says very clearly that that leads to a certain place. And we see that where it leads us in verse 6. It says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to, go ahead and say it out. It leads to death. There's, on the other hand, this, this idea of living by the Spirit. I want to take a quick moment and explain what that means, living by the Spirit. There's a, a person, uh, the third person of the Trinity. So as, as a church, we believe that God exists eternally in three persons. There's God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And that all, all these pieces, these individual persons together make up one God. And for whatever reason, Paul doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit much in Romans 1 through 7. I think the Holy Spirit is mentioned one time. And then all of a sudden in Romans chapter 8, we get to hear about the Holy Spirit 15 times. This idea of the Holy Spirit becomes very important. And here's how I understand God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the one who basically has planned our redemption. He's the one who came up with the plan for our redemption. Jesus Christ is the one who secured our redemption on the cross. The Holy Spirit is who Jesus says, I'm going to leave here with you to apply what I have secured and what my Father has planned. The Holy Spirit is what we inherit, what we get. The moment we give our lives to Christ, we get the gift of the Spirit of Christ inside of us. Listen, you, you believer, you have the Spirit of Christ inside of you as your guide. Can you imagine a better guide than that? Listen, if I have the Spirit of Christ telling me to turn right and ways is telling me to turn left, I'm going to turn right. There is no greater guide than the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about this greatest guide here in these six verses. The Spirit of Christ to guide us. And this Holy Spirit helps us to know, experience, and fellowship with Jesus. Let me tell you when, and just to show you, when at what moment you you get the Spirit of Christ as part of your life. We see this again in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. I'll put it up on the screen for you. It says, and you also, and and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In other words, the moment, believer, you heard the gospel, you heard the good news about salvation, and you believed, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. The praise of his glory. The word that's used to understand that word guaranteeing is the same word in Greek that we would use for an engagement. In other words, you have been engaged. You have been promised to. There's a relationship that you have as a follower of Christ. This Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring that we now have as a promise, as a guarantee, as a seal of something better for us. Of redemption back to God. And we understand that we talked about this word death in Romans 8, verse 6. But in Romans 8, verse 10, we understand what that death means for me as a follower of Christ and for you, those of us in this room that follow Christ. What does that death mean for you? We see that in verse 10. It says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die, 
because of sin. The Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Those of us in this room who've given our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit is within us, and because of that guide that we have, the death you will experience is just a bodily death because you are no longer under condemnation. You no longer have to pay the eternal price for sin. That's been taken care of on the cross. And the last promise I want to share with you is this, is the greatest, or the, the, the greatest promise is the last point here. The greatest promise. Romans 8, verses 15 through 17 show us this promise. We're going to skip a little bit of, of verses. Over to verse 15, it says, When you have received, or so then you have received a spirit You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you. Listen to this. When he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. Listen to this greatest promise right here. In fact... Together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. These verses right here encapsulate one of the greatest promises of Scripture, and it's this. The moment you give your life to Christ, not only is that the greatest news that you've experienced, not only have you experienced the greatest guide, the Holy Spirit now living inside of you, but you also receive this greatest promise that you are a child of God. Now, way too deep for me to go into this morning, there's a verse, there's a passage right here that says, not only are you a child of God, you are a co-heir, an equal heir with Jesus Christ. That's deep, all right? That's what you're going to be talking about in life groups this week, is what does it mean to be a co-heir with Christ? What an incredible promise we have right here. Another incredible promise we see is that you are no longer a slave to fear. If you struggle with fear, if you struggle with anxiety, you struggle with condemnation and guilt and all those things that are screaming into your ear, listen, believer, you are no longer a slave to those things. That has been released. You have been, uh, that key of promise has opened up the doors to that, that dungeon of despair in your life and you are free to run back, to get on that path. You are no longer under condemnation. What an incredible promise. You know, one of my favorite verses is this idea of calling God Abba, Father. Abba is another word for dad. It takes that word father and and really personalizes it. In fact, even a better understanding, instead of the word dad, would be the word daddy. I'll tell you what, if my girls, my daughters want something from me, they know which version of what to call me they use, right? It's not, hey, dad. All of a sudden, I get one of those, daddy, right? And I just break. I'm like, what is it? You can have it, right? I want to encourage you sometime this week in your personal prayer life, just pick at least one time this week, and in your quiet prayer life, just you and God, I want you to swap out the word God with the word daddy. Now, it might be really uncomfortable for you. Maybe you don't have a great uh, father figure in your life, and using the word daddy is something that you're not comfortable with. But listen, I want you to try it for me because it will change and revolutionize the way that you pray when you understand that you have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Talk to him that way. Now, listen, when you're praying corporately around other people, uh, sometimes using daddy might be a little distracting. Uh, you can do it. I'm, I'm all, all about it. But in your personal prayer life, talk, talk to God like your daddy. Because that's who he is. You've been adopted into sonship. That is the greatest promise. The greatest promise is this perfect inheritance. So I want to close with, with this one thought. I, I was at insomnia, so I stayed up all night, and I got home at about 7.30 in the morning. 
and I went straight to bed, and I woke up around noon, and I wasn't sure whether or not my family was home or not. So what I wanted to do is not get out of bed. I wanted to know if they were home, so I just sat there quietly for a moment, and I tried to tune my ears to whether or not there was noise happening downstairs for my family. And as I was tuning my ears, I heard some cars driving outside. I heard some people outside talking. I could hear noises all of a sudden that I hadn't heard before. I wonder whether I, you could hear the clock ticking. There are all sorts of noises all of a sudden when you really tune. And I'm trying to find, and, and my family wasn't home, so I didn't hear them. But I realized if they were home, I would have heard them. And if we could learn in our own lives to not only embrace the greatest news, but to to really embrace the greatest guide and the greatest promise by tuning our minds and our hearts to hear from that Holy Spirit that we have living inside of us. The fact that Jesus himself, the Spirit of Christ, is inside of us. If we can tune our minds and our hearts and our ears to hear from that Spirit, we will get better and better and better at hearing the Spirit in our lives. We will be able to hear more rapidly and more quickly when the Spirit is guiding us and directing us in our own lives. This one little passage of Scripture we skipped, verses 11 through 14. Listen, when we read these verses, I want you to, I want you to picture Bob Newhart, okay? It says this, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. But if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature... You will live for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. In other words, you don't have to stop it on your own. You have the Spirit within you. Through the power of God, through the power of Jesus Christ living in you, you have what it takes to understand that you have a sinful nature, the spirit of flesh, And you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And when you're making decisions, you can choose which one to tune your ear to. And when the Spirit of the flesh is guiding you or directing you off of the path, tell it to stop it. Tell yourself to stop it through the power of the Spirit living inside of you. You don't have to do it on your own. On the other hand, when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God tells you something to do this week, this is what I want you to do. I want you to say yes. I want you to hear that spirit directing you and prompting you. And I want you to say yes. If the spirit tells you to speak, then say it. What the spirit is prompting you to say. If the spirit tells you to shut up, close your mouth. If the spirit's telling you to to pull over and help someone on the side of the road, pull over and help someone. If the spirit is telling you to stop whatever you're doing and say a prayer for someone that the spirit has just put on your mind, then stop what you're doing and say a prayer. If the spirit is telling you to go across the street and mow your neighbor's lawn, I don't know why he's telling you that, but he's telling you that and he wants you to do it. So go across the street and mow your neighbor's lawn. Whatever it is the spirit is telling you to do this week, if it's the spirit of God, say yes. Let's be a congregation, a group, a body of believers that says yes to the spirit. And no to the spirit of the flesh. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for letting us explore this incredible chapter of scripture. I ask right now that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to recognize when your spirit is guiding us. And God, give us ears that can hear clearly from you. That we know when you're guiding us, when you're asking us to do something, when you're leading us to something better. And God, give us the strength through the power of your spirit to to no longer be slaves to our old nature, to say no to sin, to stop those things in our lives we need to stop, and to focus living the way you want us to live on the path that leads to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, church.